Okay, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5, verse 33. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Now, they were not interested in executing them in the legal way. They were so angry at the apostles because the apostles were obeying God that they wanted to murder Peter and the others. This was not about righteousness. This was not about justice. It was about pure hatred. It had nothing to do with God, obviously. 34. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. Gamaliel was a respected man. He was one of the Apostle Paul's professors before Paul became a Christian. Very famous teacher. Verse 35. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. In other words, be careful what you plan on doing to Peter and the other followers of Christ. See, Gamaliel does not want his fellow Jews to do anything rash. He was a wise fella. 36, he goes on. For before these days, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census, and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And, you know, in the long term, Gamaliel's observation is true. God's people will be victorious in the end. However, the outward success of a movement or the continuation of some religious experience doesn't mean that it is of God. Jesus, in fact, talks about the spiritual weeds and the spiritual wheat growing together until the end of the age. At that time, what is of God will be separated from what is not of God. 40. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Beat them likely means lash them with a whip 39 times. That is not what Gamaliel advised. But I suppose they wanted to back their warning with force and show the apostles who was boss, so they beat them anyway. 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And they were stinging, too, but they were also rejoicing. It is an honor to suffer for Christ. It is a privilege to complete in our bodies the sufferings of Christ for His church. It is a privilege to sacrifice something in response to all the kindness Christ has shown us. And they understood that. 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They were jailed. They were warned. They were beaten because they preached the word of God. So first chance they got they're out preaching the word of God. Discomfort, trouble, 
opposition isn't necessarily a sign that the door to ministry is shut. Discomfort, trouble may make it harder to do what is right, but it shouldn't stop us from trying. As we see here, chapter 6, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The Hellenists and the Hebrews were both Hebrew Christians. They were actually two segments of a very large and fast-growing early Christian church. And when you have a group that large, some are bound to be overlooked. And of course, then there is the possibility of division and hard feelings. And that's kind of what was happening here. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Serving tables is a worthy Christian ministry. But the apostles were called to prayer and to teaching, the teaching of God's word. So it would not be the proper thing for them to do. Verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So, they needed to find some Christians who had the gift of administration, I suppose, and they also needed to be men of good spiritual character. Any honest labor becomes a holy ministry when it is done for God's glory by people who are living for God. Verse 4, But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, if a pastor is not devoted to prayer and teaching the Word of God, his priorities are dead wrong. Well, if someone says, well, my church won't give me enough time to do that, then quit. And let them hire someone else to run their social club. Do what the scriptures say you should do, not some church board and not some denomination. Five. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nacanor, and Timon, and Paramenes, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. It wasn't the correct thing to do because it was pleasing. It wasn't the correct thing to do because it was popular. It was the correct thing to do because the apostles who Christ put in charge of the church said it was correct. You see, it does not matter if something is pleasing. It matters if God's word says do it. Verse 6 And they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. The seven chosen men would not be teaching the Word of God. Nevertheless, their physical labor would be spiritual in nature because it was done for the church. And that is why the apostles laid hands on them. The apostles commissioned them. Verse 7. And the Word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Well, division was threatening the church, but the apostles handled the problem biblically, and therefore the problem went away. Problems between people are inevitable. But when they are handled with wisdom from God, they will not ruin the relationship. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Now, Stephen was filled with God's grace. God's grace is the fuel that empowers our souls to do the right thing. 
God's grace is his gift that enables us to say and do what is pleasing to him, even if it is hard on us. Verse 9. And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedman, as it was called, and of Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with, C with Stephen. Um, you see that Jerusalem had a variety of synagogues for foreign Jews to visit while they were in town, probably for the religious festivals. And some of these foreign Jews started to argue with Stephen, who was, of course, a Christian Jew. And at first, it appears that it was sort of a gentleman's discussion. Notice verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Now, it doesn't say that Stephen was smarter or had more formal education than his accusers. He spoke with greater wisdom because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I like how that works because it means that it can be true of any of us as well, regardless of our educational background or lack of it. The important thing is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God grants you wisdom, and you can confound those who are considered to be wise in this world. Because God is wiser than all. 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. When an unbeliever doesn't want truth, they often slander the one who speaks truth. These foreign Jews were no match for Stephen and his Holy Spirit inspired words, so what do they do? They're no match, they slander him. Verse 12, And they stirred up the people, and the elders, and the scribes, and they came upon him, and seized him, and brought him before the council. In other words, they spread panic among the people concerning the things Stephen was saying. Like political demagoguery, they used inflamed rhetoric to turn the people against Stephen, to turn the people, therefore, against Christianity. Many people will believe a lie if it is told with enough passion. 13. And they set up a false witness, and they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And I'm sure that Stephen did say that the holy place, the temple, and the ceremonial law was to be set aside. He would say that because Jesus' death fulfilled the things that those things pointed to. Their false accusations came from putting a false spin, though, on Stephen's words. You see, the devil accomplishes a lot. By taking the word of God and repeating it out of context. And that's what they did. Verse 15. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face, Stephen's face, was like the face of an angel. I'm sure Stephen... Uh, Although he was in trouble and about to be stoned to death, obviously from the, the scripture here, it indicates he was very calm and he has a holy confidence that can only come from knowing you are in the will of God. Chapter 7, and the high priest said, are these things so? The high priest wants a yes or no answer. Did you speak against Moses? Did you speak against the temple? Yes or no? But this is an opportunity for Stephen to accuse the Jews of killing the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that is what he will do in his speech. And 
Here he goes. He begins with a history lesson. Verse 2. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. God calling Abraham was the first step toward him developing into the nation Israel. God told Abraham what to do and where to go, and Abraham obeyed. And it is the duty of all God's people to follow the known will of God. And so he continues in verse 3, And he said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. And then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into the land in which you are now living. Abraham went when God said go, even though God didn't tell him where he would end up. Abraham obeyed God's command, even though he did not know what the outcome would be. You see, Abraham trusted that God was good and that he knew what he was doing. Lesson. Uncertainty over the end result is never a reason to disobey God. Verse 5. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And there were times when God's promise seemed a million miles away to Abraham. He said, Abraham, God said, Abraham, I give you and your descendants all this land. Well, that's nice, but I'm in my 90s and I still don't have even one child. And although I've been here for years, I don't own any land. I think time is running out, Lord. I mean, that's what Abraham started thinking. Verse 6, And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them four hundred years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. In other words, your descendants will leave this place, Abraham, this place that I have led you to. Your descendants will eventually leave it, but I'll bring them back. And God's promise was fulfilled, even though it took 400 years for it to happen. You know, God may have to raise us from the dead years from now to fulfill all His good promises to us. And if that's what He has to do, then that is what He will do. Verse 8. And He gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And that's when the family of Israel was in place to become the nation Israel. Stephen was accused of being against Israel. But by his words, he's saying, no, I'm pro-Israel. Stephen talked about how the 12 tribes of Israel had their beginning with God, working through Abraham. That's pro-Israel. He's trying to get the Jewish authorities to understand that he has reverence for God and appreciation for Israel's roots. Don't call me anti-Israel because I speak against the temple. I speak against the temple because I'm speaking the word of God. Verse 9. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. A reminder from Stephen to the Jews that their ancestors rejected God's man, Joseph. Do you see the connection he's making between what the ancestors did to Joseph and what the religious authorities did to Christ and are now doing to him? You see the connection there? Verse 9 and 10, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, 
sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Another connection. Joseph and Jesus were both misused. They were both betrayed by their fellow Jews. See these connections he's making. They both suffered unjustly, but God was on Joseph's side. God was on Jesus' side. God exalted Joseph, and he raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 11. Now these, excuse me, now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan in great affliction when our fathers could find no food. Here's another connection. After Joseph's brothers, the Jewish ancestors, rejected Joseph, they went through a long, long famine. They went through big trouble. After the Israelites rejected Christ, they entered a prolonged period of big trouble as well. Verse 12. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. The Jewish ancestors rejected Joseph, but later recognized him as being God's man and their savior from that horrible famine, too. And the same pattern will be followed by the Jews concerning Jesus. They will one day realize that they killed their Lord. They will repent, and they will return, and it will be good for them. Seventeen. But as the time of the promise drew near which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time Moses was born and he was, a beautiful, he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, but they couldn't hide him any longer, and they were afraid that the Egyptians would discover him and kill him like they were doing with the other Hebrew baby boys. It's verse 21, And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him, and brought him up as her own son. Moses' mom put him in a waterproof basket and set him in the Nile River. That's when God, by his providence, caused Moses to be found by Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 22. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Moses... Uh, was the adopted grandson of Pharaoh, actually. And so he, was, he had it made down there, in a sense. He was taught all the wisdom of Egypt. He was smart. And Moses knew how to get things done, too. Verse 23. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. At some point, Moses discovered that he was Hebrew, not Egyptian. So at age 40, when he was a captain in the Egyptian army, a war hero, and next in line to be king, he visited his Hebrew brothers. 24. And seeing one of them being wronged, 
He defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. By helping the Hebrew slave, Moses turned his back on Egypt. Right there. The Bible says we cannot serve God and the world. We cannot do right and wrong. We must choose. Moses chose right and lost all the benefits of being a big shot in Egypt. He chose right when he helped the Hebrew slave and turned his back on godless Egypt. Verse 25. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. See? Israel rejected another one of God's deliverers, Moses. They had rejected Mo Joseph and then Moses. And therefore, it's not surprising that they rejected their Messiah, who also happened to be God's son. You see the pattern that he's developing here. 26. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers, why do you wrong each other? And so the next day Moses saw two Israelites fighting with each other. And he tried to be a peacemaker. You know, God's people have enough opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil without fighting with each other also. So he tried to break up this fight between two Hebrews, two of God's people. That's not always appreciated. Verse 27, But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? In other words, in other words, he told Moses to mind his own business. You're not our ruler. Well, you know what? Moses was God's hand-picked ruler for Israel, but they missed it. Same thing happened with Christ. That's the point of all this, that Stephen is saying all these things to these Hebrews. This is the point. Verse 28. He continues, do you, want, do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Well, Moses put his neck on the line to save a Hebrew from an Egyptian. Moses gave up everything to save a Hebrew from an Egyptian. He turned his back on Egypt. But the Israelites did not appreciate his kindness. And Jesus did many kind things for Israel as well. They did not appreciate him either. Same old story. Same old thing. Verse 29. At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Well, we'll pick it up right here next time. So hold your place. Come back next time as we continue going verse by verse through the book of Exodus. Until then, so long everyone.